Welcome back, everyone, to Vox Markets. My name is Paul Hill, and I'm delighted today to be able to speak to James Thorne of Columbia Threadneedle, one of the city's rising stars of small cap investing. So welcome, James. Hello. Hello. Well, well um, given the UK government's um, successful sort of vaccination uh, programme, together with actually today, which is quite good, You've got restaurants and pubs and cinemas opening indoors as well. What's your sort of like your big picture view of small caps going forward? Um, well, I think it's always slightly dangerous being a small cap manager that you're a bit evangelical, but I'm, I'm pretty optimistic, really. I mean, I think, you know, the government's right to be cautious, but I think the scientists are saying all the right noises about the fact that the vaccine programme will have to, you know, continue, um, but we're going to get ahead of it from here. So... I think the outlook looks pretty, pretty solid. Um, yeah. And I think the UK markets are still relatively undervalued versus European and US markets. Well, certainly on your, on your portfolio, there's definitely some good deep value plays, which we'll go into in a, in a bit more detail. But obviously, we've got news over the weekend that sort of worried a few politicians and scientists alike of this Indian variant. And given that what seems to be happening is that the scientists have been a bit behind the curve. In fact, everybody has, really. We underestimated the speed of transmission and the speed of mutation of this thing. And what seems to be happening is that people who uh, uh, haven't been able to beat it have been acting as incubators. And that's why we've got literally thousands and thousands of variants around the world. And, and only a few of them are really bad. So how do you see that potentially impacting international travel given that if we have if we retain sort of relatively hardish sort of borders within the UK? Um, I think I think ultimately it'll surprise people. I mean, it reminds me going back to 9-11 um, um, and that uh, horrendous tragedy and the expectation mm. for international travel. And then the question was, OK, well, people are just going to be very uncomfortable travelling for many, many years and they'll change their behavior because just their, their attitude to risk has completely gone up. Mm. And yeah, you know, I'm not, I mean, none of us are, you know, epidemiologists, even the epidemiologists are sort of slightly guessing, but certainly I think the success of us, you know, creating vaccines that are pretty, pretty efficacious, um, you know, right from the offset shows that we're going to get a handle on this. And I think then the second question is, is the demand going to be there for people to do have international travel and to go abroad? Um, and the behavioural scientists all say that, you know, once people, you know, human beings, once they've been through a tragedy, want to go and experience new things and are quite optimistic about going forward. So I, I think international travel will, will roar back in 2022 yes. and 2023. Agreed. And I think it will be a roar. It will be a huge upsurge. And there'll be a few false dawns. I mean, chatting to my colleague in January, we went, do you know what? The hardest moment will be around May mm. when the uncertainty about will it, won't it, will we open up? Have we beat this? And, and I think that's, you know, that's certainly played out that uncertainty around international travels, um, you know, how quickly we're going to open up is pretty, pretty high at the moment. But I, I think that'll resolve itself, you know, in the yeah, next couple I of quarters. Yeah, I would agree. I think there's massive pent up demand for, for foreign holidays. I mean, I guess the question is, is when and what about this summer in terms of sort of like, and I did notice one of your stocks, Jet 2, for instance, has actually roared back since the lows <laughs> of, of May and did a big placing, I think, um, only at the start of the year at about £11. It's trading at about sort of like 13, 14 quid at the moment. But if you actually run the numbers, I think it did 90p of EPS pre-pandemic. So it's trading at about 15 times earnings or something like that pre-pandemic, which makes which makes sense. But how do you see do you, how do you see sort of like foreign holidays this summer out in the UK, given that, you know, obviously Boris wants to be doesn't want another strain coming in or, <laughs> or, or others coming in? Well, like, like, I mean, like Boris, you don't want to be overly optimistic about your thoughts because you wouldn't want, you know, either your friends or families to go and book a foreign holiday on the back of, yeah. you know, you being an optimist and then and then struggling to go abroad. Um, so I think, again, I think, you know, this year is going to be stop and start. I think if you're really persistent, you'll find somewhere you can go away on a holiday at some point. But I think in terms of the Jet 2 as a story, it's not really around this summer so much because yes. I think they've raised capital. They've got a lot of cash on the balance sheet. 
They've never been overgeared. So unlike TUI, they didn't use their customers' cash mm. to effectively fund the business. It's in a yeah. segregated account. So if they if they if you need the money back because you can't travel, they're going to give it back to you. And they showed historically over the other lockdowns, they've done that and they've treated their customers really well. But they've also treated their staff really well and they have the capacity ready to go. So within a few weeks, they can dial all that capacity up. And you've got to remember that just before the pandemic, Thomas Cook went into administration. Now, I know there's been a sort of a, a repackaging of the Thomas Cook business, but they had nearly 30% of the UK market. Mm -hmm. um, and I think Jet2 has got a really strong business with a really strong culture. And I think it'll come back very, very strongly. And I think it'll take significant market share in what will be a boom time for holidays and travel for several years post, post the pandemic. Well, remind me, when I book my holiday, I'm going to book with Jet 2 then in that case, because one, it's not going to go bust and two, if I, if I can't travel, it'll give me my money back. Now, moving on to some real sort of like secular sort of like growers, tech um, stocks in particular, you've got some lovely uh, companies in there. And the one which really had a trading update, actually, interestingly, this morning, as you could probably guess which one I'm going to talk about, Blue Prism. Now, as I understand it, having looked at it before, it's sort of like a... Um, software robotic sort of automation firm that is really going to revolutionize, revolutionize sort of like white collar workers across the world having we've seen sort of factory automation and it's one of the sort of top three players but it's it's it, what's your view on, on the on this company because it is a bit of a battleground stock i mean i did again i noticed that the short interest in this is the, is the, is the 11th most shortest stock on the FTSE amazingly enough even though it's an absolute world leader in sort of robotic process automation. Yeah, no, it's it's a very emotive stock, it seems, Blue Prism. Mm. And we try and take the emotion out of it. I mean, when when Blue Prism was floating, and I think um, post the fundraise, I think they raised £7 million originally. Yeah. Um, post money, it was about, I don't know, 60 or 70 million market cap. But I remember coming in to see me and they, 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 they sat down and sort of started talking in RPA. And I was sort of going, well, hang on a second. You, you basically mean writing a script, mm. which if you imagine, you know, you, you can take, um, you know, a lot of computer software programs and, and write basically your own sort of short software program to do a very basic task. Yeah. Now, th those have been around for um, a long time and they combine that with screen scraping. So, you know, back to the holiday point. If you want to book a holiday through on the beach or someone like that, they effectively scream, scrape, Ryanair, Lufthansa. So they don't they don't have software that integrates into the Ryanair website. They effectively um, a, a pretend they're a person and book. Well, they don't. They pretend you're you and book your ticket on Ryanair. Um, and that's something that Blue Prism can effectively do. But the point is, there have been people who have been able to write those programs for a long period of time. And so that's why it surprises me at the moment that everyone's got quite so concerned about this being a commoditized market because, um, sorry, beg your pardon, not my thing. It was, uh, it was, um, it was it's probably uh, Blue Prism ringing you. Yeah, probably the best <laughs> asking about their share price. But um, yeah. it was a, it was a commoditized market right at the very start. And there's all this sort of concern that it's commoditized. Now they do have two big competitors who raise lots of money. Um, but as we always say in lots of businesses, having lots of capital is not necessarily the route to success. Uh, and the way I look at it in the Blue Prism have understood that right from the start. And it's all around having things like security ingrained and being able to scale it ac across the globe. So their competitors are great. They can have this software program running on your own little PC doing jobs for you. What they can't do is effectively change the processes in big enterprises across the world and have this all automated. But not only that, they're also allowed AI to get into enterprises. AI is this amazing buzz buzzword that everyone mm. uses in quotes, but a lot of people actually understanding what does it really do. Yeah. And to get that intelligence into a business is quite difficult. And I see Blue Prism as one of the key plumbing to, um, to AI. And, and the best way of imagining it, I imagine, is like Apple App Store. So Apple's never thought to itself, we're going to be the people who are going to able to write all the apps people want, the killer apps for consumers, for business. But what we're going to do is we're going to write an app store. And so it's very open for people to come and write apps that people might really want to use. And we'll take fees on that. 
Mm. And Blue Prism's done that with its what, what it terms its digital exchange. You can go in there and integrate into Blue Prism. So effectively, you can get AI through your application or, or your software component into an enterprise. And I think that's going to become incredibly powerful. And yeah. that's really just at the start of its growth. But I think people's understanding of the business is at the moment in a bit of a stop start. And yeah. so we'll work through that over time. Um, yeah. And I, I'm still very optimistic for the outlook for this. Yeah, I mean, I, I think there's lots of optimism from people like Gartner as well. I did see some stats that they reckon that the, the whole industry is worth about in revenue, sort of like $2 billion per annum. But they reckon over the next decade, it's going to go tenfold to 20 billion. And I did notice at the um, Blue Prism's last prelims presentation, they said they had around about 20% of the market. Now, if they if, if ever get anywhere near 20% when it gets yeah. to 20 billion, then that's a four billion pound, four billion dollar revenue business. And it's only worth a billion pounds at the moment. So uh, there's plenty of plenty of upside, no doubt about it. And again, I would reference one of the competitors, I think he's called Unipath, which just floated on NASDAQ. UiPath. Yeah. Romanian. Romanian Roman, listed on Yeah, NASDAQ. but it's just floated in the States, hasn't it? And, it and, has, yeah. And the ticker is, is is called PATH, so have a look at it for investors. But as I I ran the numbers on it, and it's on a EV sales multiple of 35 versus Blue Prisms on five. So uh, I guess there's a bit of a push to to get Blue Prism to uh, to list in the States as well. Well, just yeah. one final bit on Blue Prism. What I, what I, I mean, I love the story. I think it's great, really is. I mean, no doubt about it. You had one of the US um, banking analysts who, who said that, you know, 20,000 people would be replaced by automation just in the US on the banking because they're just basically moving around in, you know, numbers between themselves. And it's, it's, it's that whole sort of automation of, of the white column. You can see this happening and revolutionizing lots and lots of industries. So I love the story. One thing I could difficult to get my head around is just the number of, is how much they spend on sales and marketing. I mean, I, I was expecting them to spend like a, the similar number to their R and D, but it's five times more. And they sort of like, is it is it all just sales commission? Because I mean, they've got turnover about one hundred forty mil pounds, and they spent hundred million on sales and marketing last year. I mean, it just seems uh, seems so excessive. Well, that's we, we're we're having conversations with the management about that. And oh, are you okay? Thing, Good. I'll leave that. The... <laughs> well, let's let's part that. Though, but I'm glad it's being dealt a lot, with. A lot, of, a lot of the pushback I get is, look, how could you invest in this business? It's loss making. But what people forget is this company makes an 85 percent gross margin. Yeah, or so more even if you take a out. There's a huge pool of profit sitting in that business, and they spend. They 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 were a bit slow on spending an R and D, but they've caught up with that. So they spend over 20 million on R&D. And I think that's enough considering, back to my point, they're trying to create sort of the app store rather than do everything for all people. Yeah. And it's the key thing is how, they, how they've structured the business to be able to scale and have security. But yeah, ultimately, if you wanted this, most software companies, SaaS, SaaS software, so that's recurring, high yeah. quality, spend about 20 to 25% of their revenue on sales and marketing. That, that's to still be able to grow but not at huge rates. So with Blue Prism spending, as you say, about 100 million or so on- 70%, and, 70%. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> then you're either expecting growth to really surge or yeah. this business could be very profitable today. Yes. And you've got to remember, you know, at the end of the day, a lot of these salespeople sit in the US, the cost of restructuring that cost base would be relatively low. So you, this business could throw off quite a lot of cash and quite a, pro, a lot of pro, profit. It's not a case of this is a concept stock where at yes, some point it agreed. might be possible. Yeah. Well, I think you give me two bits of advice today. One book with Jet2 and two get a job with Blue Prism as a salesman <laughs> <laughs> because it seems to be the right approach. Now, just moving on to, uh, again, two sort of like secular growers, which have been through the mill over the last five years because I've been tracking them for some time. But they're in geo, uh, uh, geo spatial data and software and stuff. One is called One Space, another one's called um, IGQ. IQ Geo. Oh, yeah, that's the one. Uh, and can you just take us through the thesis behind those? Because they seem to be, rather than sort of like trying to win the global market, they're real sort of like niche software players with strong vertical market positions. Is that the sort of right take or? How do you see the investment thesis of both of them? Well, I mean, I'd, I'd say to your point about they're not trying to dominate the global markets. Well, I would say in their niches, they, they are. Yes, 
Yes, um, in the niches. Yeah. I think, well, you know, you sort of, you know, if you look at my portfolio and go, well, hang on a second, why have you got these two tiddlers that have been through the mill? And it is really back to what we try and look for, especially in tech, is mm. very strong market positions that have been long formed and the market's not going to change for a long time and people really need what they sell. So, you know, One Spatial's been around for a long time and mm. it was kind of mismanaged, went a bit wrong. Um, and the new management team have done a great job. And essentially, um, you have to go back to a little bit of history about, and, and well, you know, what is what is geospatial software? So any utility company, whether it be, you know, your water company, your gas company, or your electricity, needs to have data and mapping around where their, where their assets are, where their power lines are, where their water pipes are. And that really comes back to having geospatial data. So, and, and that is all shared in a, in, a, you know, in a database or a repository somewhere. And that used to be like a dedicated department. There was sort of, you know, a department of, you know, very bright, you know, sort of in a, in a department who, who kind of kept all of that. And that was all their property. And, and they gave out physical maps to people who had to actually go and do things to those assets. Now, over time, things have changed and everyone wants, you know, all of this technology and data, um, you know, on 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 their mobile phone, on Touch their tablet. Button. And they would need to be to go, consistent, isn't it? As yeah. Well. And the other thing is to get to net zero and also with the increase in communication, the amount of money being spent upgrading um, power networks, mm. water networks, um, but also, you know, cable networks, cable to Brew our homes. Bar, yeah, broadband, net, fiber we're talking, networks. We're, we're talking trillions. Yes. And when people go and dig up your rows, they need to know what assets are under that road and where they are, because otherwise they come back again. I mean, just look at my road. They're digging it up <laughs> for the third time in the last couple of months. <laughs> and you really need to know all of that. And, and the two businesses approach this massive opportunity in two different ways. And they've got amazing sort of legacy position. I mean, a lot of the geospatial knowledge came out of Cambridge Mm. in the sort of late 70s, early 80s. And these businesses were all born out of that knowledge base in and around the Cambridge, Cambridge Basin. Um, but then, of course, some of those businesses were bought out and then dominated by the Americans. They got a bit sort of, you know, they got a bit lazy about, you know, moving it forward. And both the businesses have got different technologies that effectively put all of that data in the people who are digging up your roads' hands and also the planners of where you dig up your roads in those people's hands. And, they had a few false starts because just being a small business that grows steadily, you know, there's a lot of costs to overcome. You've got to invest in sales and marketing. You've got to invest in product. And so the profitability has taken some time to come through. But also your customers are very conservative. You know, if you think to the power networks or the water networks, they don't make decisions overnight. It's not like selling consumer software. It takes years for them to get comfortable and then buy. And we're just at that point where they've got comfortable um, they really need it. They really need it to make themselves more efficient. And yeah. so those businesses are starting to succeed. And I think, you know, we've taken the long term approach by being involved. You know, we're, we're the largest investor in one, second largest investor in the other. And, and we think those businesses have got a very strong secular trend for the next, you know, 10, 20 years. And, and one spatial this morning just announced its UK patent. A lot of its yes. technology is highly patentable. Um, so, yeah, we think the outlook is, is very bright for both of them. Yeah, I mean, I love the sort of like the mix because, you know, you've got, if you've got dominant niche sort of like point software solutions in certain verticals, they're, they're under the radar for the big sort of the Googles, the Microsofts, the Amazons of this world. And therefore they can absolutely control that particular small niche area and do very, very well. And I, I love that sort of tech. You know, you either, go, if you're going to go big, you go big with the best, which is, hopefully you know blue prism or if you're going to go small if you go smaller you go basically to somebody who's a big fish in that small pond and those two would fit the bill and i would say just point investors both of those companies and one spatial and um iq geo are trading actually on pretty reasonable ev to sales multiples and both of them have got plenty of cash on the balance sheet so there's absolutely no reason why they need to uh, to invest other than if they obviously so get a complementary acquisition now that drink brings me perfectly into your next point solution, which is actually the granddaddy of the data erasure sector, Blanco. And I do know yeah. a bit about this one. It's run by a guy called Matt Jones. And, it, and they sort of like, uh, I think they've been again through the mill. But can you just take us through this, this investment features here? Because uh, I think it's a great company. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's one of those areas that, you know, it's sort of like, well, if you didn't think about it, you'd never think, well, mm. why, why do I need that? But yeah. Um, 
I mean, we've seen the fines that Marriott Hotels had last year, BA had last year about yeah. you know, cybersecurity, security of your data. And I think basically when, when you know, you've got a phone or a laptop or even a server base, you know, that companies use to, to, to support all their software, when it comes to the end of their life, you need to dispose of those assets. And more and more now they're being recycled or repurposed because just filling a hole in the ground and throwing them in is not very good for yeah. the environment or society. And you need to know where those assets are going to end up because you might resell them. And actually just deleting um, everything doesn't off delete, laptop, does you it? might think it's gone. It hasn't no. gone. You need to do it um, uh, in a way that makes sure that that data is never recoverable. It really has been wiped off. And mm. and Blanco, as you said, it went through several iterations. It was in a it was in a much more commoditized business, but it bought this world leading company in Scandinavia that basically had a lot of lot of intellectual property around the ability to erase data and do it quickly, but also have all of the regulations and agreements across the globe that it that it effectively has has taken that liability of erasing that data away from you. And they spent years and years putting that portfolio of intellectual property in place. And it's a very rapidly going market because all companies and all enterprises are going, well, we can't just, you know, throw away these assets at the end. We have a responsibility mm -hmm. to recycle them. And we also have a major responsibility to our customers and our clients that, that their data is not getting passed around to whoever, or whoever might end up with those yeah those otherwise you get fined by the by G, under gdpr well, exactly well it's carrot and stick isn't it you know yeah. it's, um they should really do the right thing by their customers and many of their clients obviously are doing the right thing by their customers but also there's a very big stick by the regulator to make sure that they um they that that they, they, they uh, act on that as well so that business has been growing really well um we we really like the management team um, an American management team who are, you know, very focused on selling um, yeah. in a sustainable way. And um, yeah, again, you know, it's it's a long term structural trend. Um, and again, you know, that business has had a bit more success. So it's on a more um, a more um, uh, optimistic uh, valuation. Yes. But we actually think if you look at the scale of that market mm. and the fact that it's now got some people such as um you know, Amazon helping sell its products. There could yeah. at some point be a very rapid acceleration of their growth. And it's also, I think, integrating to other big sort of like ecosystems like ServiceNow and all these kind of guys. And I think the one, I mean, I was on the analyst call actually at the, I think it was the half year or it was the half year, it was the half year. And um, they're expecting a, a, a monster second half because I think mobile, the upgrade cycle for 5G phones is going to lead to yeah. literally hundreds of millions of good, valuable iphone 4s being upgraded to the iphone 5 or you know the 5g version so uh these this are absolutely masses of um of devices which need their their software and and again it is do, you can't you just wiping just just doing deleting your own data doesn't <laughs> because i think i think it was something like wikileaks or something like that all some really big you know problems in government data have been caused by people sort of like thinking that it's gone and it hasn't it's still on the uh no. You know, right. on the actual device. So again, just then one another stock which is another got great opportunity roadway uh, runway ahead is Tiny Build, which I did see had been tipped by Justin Urquhart Stewart in the Daily Mail over the weekend. So you're in good company here. You got in before <laughs> him, I guess, because it recently raised was about 155 million yeah. pounds, didn't it? Or that's, it's, it's sort of like some of it went for the business and more went for outside shareholders. But it's um, it's done very well, actually. I think it was 169, it, 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 its placing price. And I think it's on about, uh, what was it on today? Two something or other. So it's actually gone up quite nicely in the last few months. Yeah, no, no, it's been it's been a very good uh, float for us this year, um, and I, I think that's because of the ambition of the management team and 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 what it does. I mean, we what, like, what does we it like... do again? What does it do again? Well, so it's it's what it's what they call an indie indie games company, an indie games, yeah. and I guess indie games just mean they sit outside, you know, the FIFA football or um, you know the major racing titles or um, you know, um, well, yeah. Fortnite essentially was a which a lot of people. Have, you know, yeah. parents of kids in their in their teens will heard of Fortnite, probably, you know, uh, pulled their hair out. But, um, you know, it's it, indie games are, you know, a growing area. And we really like, obviously like the games market because it was growing last year because of COVID. But mm. this wasn't just really an opportunity because of COVID. It was also an opportunity because 
that area is in in good structural growth. Um, and the top end's very competitive. You know, to write a triple A game, as they call them, you need very very deep product uh, uh, pockets. But um, people want to play around with fun games. And and the great thing about Tiny Build is they use social media incredibly effectively to uh, promote their games. And these are all titles we'll have never heard of. But you know, if yeah, if, just if didn't happen either. To, <laughs> teenage kids you know hello neighbor yeah. too um yeah. you probably will have heard of and that's the great thing you're not taking a risk on an individual title you're not waiting there yeah. biting your nails as to whether their next big launch is going to succeed um and they've raised all of that money to basically go and support um and effectively acquire developers uh, primarily in eastern europe central and eastern europe where um there are some really high quality talent and they're, they're struggling to get to market. And, and really, Tiny Build can take them to the next level by using their social media platform to promote their game. Um, yeah. and, we, and we think that's a very, very strong proposition. Well, I'll have to try one of their um, their biggest games, Graveyard Creeper, apparently, <laughs> whatever that is. <laughs> but I, again, I'll point, I mean, something which I didn't realise, and I'll point investors to have a look at, is the game sector, the computer game sector, is bigger than both the film and yeah. music industries combined. I mean, that is just, when you think about it, that is just phenomenal. So, yeah. um, plenty, and there's plenty of growth. Another one, which is sort of like uh, another business, a bit bigger this time, is Future, which is really now sort of like moving into the digital real estate industry because it, it bought, um, I think you bought Go Compare not long ago and, and then be, recently bought Marie Claire. Yeah, and I mean, that seems to be, a, it's a big business. And again, it's had a few detractors in sort of like people with a bit of a battleground, but it seems to have got through all of that and actually uh, is in a really good place. Yeah, I mean, I think they've done an amazing job. I mean, that, that, that goes back to, you know, having really good tech. I mean, if you went back, what, five or six years ago, Future nearly went bust. Mm. Um, they had some debt on the balance sheet and they, they had basically all this editorial. They were all magazines. So, yeah, you know, yeah, Marie Claire, you, isn't it, or something? Exactly. Yeah. If you wanted to read Marie Claire or What Hi-Fi or Cycling Weekly, you went into WH Smiths and you picked up the magazine. And yeah. that's what that's what Future owned. Yeah. Um, and obviously it was declining and you're selling advertising in that magazine to um, to pay for your editorial staff and the content in there. So that's, that's quite a tricky place to be. And obviously the key was to move online. Um, and so they've moved online very successfully. But... What they've also done is actually held the technology to sell that advertising space effectively um, to, to the advertisers, but also to the owners of the product that you might be reviewing. So whether it be bikes, cameras, stereos, you know, the people who make those products are really keen to be, you know, in the reviewed sites, but also promoted in those sites. And, and Future has got the technology to allow that to be enabled. And so, you know, it has been going around buying magazine estates um you know editorial content and being able to convert it online um and that's a very rapidly growing area but i think they're not stopping there and i think that's where the market got a little bit confused when they went and bought go compare and it's like well yeah hang on a second why are you buying a price comparison site where you buy your auto insurance which is the first place i think if if you look to go compare what you would do on that site um, and of course, you've got amazing footfall. You know, they do have um, car magazines and they have, you know, motorbike magazines, um, but also, you know, home lifestyle magazines. So they've got a lot of footfall of people who are interested in their editorial and they can then proposition with the best insurance products for their cars, their homes. Mm. And that's one of the big issues that the price comparison sites have had is that they've got to spend a lot of money marketing to their customers mm. to get them to come back again. Yeah. Um, and that's where there's a very interesting little kernel within Go Compare, which is, which was basically their auto safe product. Mm. So you know, I've been a bit lazy about switching my electricity and and um, and gas. I'm sure I could do it a lot more often and yeah. save some money, but it's a headache. You've got to go yeah. on the website, you've got to type in your information, you've then got you know follow up with some emails. So the auto safe product is the idea is you give all your details once, and it will automatically transfer you to the products at the best price going forward um, wow. and that's taken a lot of investment by uh, go compare over the last five or six years and the business hadn't really seen any profitability from it it started to see some huge great growth in subscribers which is not surprising because i mean why wouldn't you i mean I'd, mm. I'd sign up to it um but we were just at that tipping point where that business was due to become very cash generative and very profitable in the next yeah. sort of couple of years and i think future will be able to accelerate that just to your point you know 
it's got an amazing real estate space online in terms of, you know, and this goes back to the next point, which is Google. And Google's going to change this great term of cookie, cookie data in a year or so and turn it off. And um, having great content and great editorial is going to be crucial to, um, to keeping all of that data and those customers. Particularly if actually if your customer base, if it's like Marie Claire and the well-to-do ladies who have got high disposable income, they're actually quite valuable people to have as your sort of like your client base to be able to monetize and to, uh, you know, to sell advertising. Now, a couple of, again, a couple of sort of like B2B fintech companies um, are Gentex and Equals. Now, I know a bit, again, a bit about Equals because it's run by a guy called Ian Strafford-Taylor and both of those businesses are now really starting to see the, the, the green shoots, I believe, in terms of sort of like um, doing international payments for um, for their B2B customers, because as the economy, you know, sort of like opens up, they're making more of their client base are having to go through Brexit and buying abroad and sort of like improving their, um, you know, their corporate expenditure. But how, how do you see both of those businesses placed? Yeah, I mean, they're they're both basically plays on the fact that the clearing banks um, take the mick when, you know, travel internationally or, you know, or as a SME, a small business, you're trying to to hedge the risk on currencies moving around as you're selling products or services. Mm. And the clearing banks charge a fortune for it. Um, And basically, these two companies, like a lot of the other um, startups, are effectively offering those services in a better way than the clearing banks would easier easier to use uh, more functionality but at a lower cost yeah um and lots, i think the difference, like. <laughs> yeah exactly why and, and i think the difference is you know back to the point about almost um blue prism and ui path you know ui path is selling very aggressively what i would say is maybe a less value product but it's mm. it, it's really aggressive in that sales pitch yeah that's the same with equals you know equals is is selling in a sensible way, a really good quality products. Mm. Um, there are a lot of competitors in that market being a very aggressive around selling to customers. And then once they've got those customers, they're going to charge them a lot more for some of those other services that sit around it. Mm. Um, so, you know, Equals is building a sustainable business. And I think it would have moved on a lot further if we hadn't had COVID and lockdown, because a lot of their products are around managing your you know your your international travel for small businesses, and I think we'll see we'll see that come back when we see international travel recover. Well, there's international travel, but I think just bringing just just importing and exports are going to be a, a big. Uh, I mean, yeah, I, yeah. I, I mean, I, it was quite interesting as a data point when I spoke to uh, to Ian Strapper Taylor in uh, April, I think it was after their prelims, just very briefly. He was telling me that in March he'd seen a big imp- increase in B two B because uh, the uh, the filming industry had started up because I think they, they service quite a few of them and they were they were on shoots around London so uh, they'd actually started to see it and if you've had a good March they'll have had a good April and uh, and May I thought now just for investors I point to have a look at the sort of valuation multiples because. I think the I think the biggest you know Alpha FX is on about nine times sales. Our Gentex is on 3.8 times sales. And as I worked it out, I think Equals is on two times sales. So there's a big sort of valuation catch, a bit like um, UiPath and, um, and and Blue Prism. Now, here's one that is really, again, a bit of a sort of battleground. City World, reopening trade. It, are people going to go back to the cinema? And I think we've probably said, yes, they are, because it's a fantastic <laughs> slate. I'm looking forward to Matrix 4. Uh, Top Gun and uh, and 007 myself. But one thing I hadn't noticed, it, this stock, and, and I'll give you talk through the ups and downs on this one, it's actually the second most shortest stock on the FTSE with, with a 7.2% short interest, which is like, frankly, amazing. Yeah, I mean, it, it does have quite a lot of debt. And I guess people... Yeah, okay, yeah, it's four times EBITDA, yeah, <laughs> I agree. About, about the debt levels. I mean, I think that's where we see a lot of the value i mean i think you know the first instance is do you believe and we could we could go through multitude of reasons why why people will go back to the cinema but i'm know, heading back this is a poll of me i'm going back to watch yeah well, i'm, I'm going back i mean i don't know i've got two young daughters and unless yeah. i'm watching a disney film the chances of me sitting down in peace and watching a film <laughs> in the last year and a half were like nil so you yeah know, you go to the cinema because especially also these blockbusters they are, you know, they are an all-round experience. You know, they're a thrill ride as much as, you know, um, 
as, as much as just the cinematography. And you want to go to an environment that enhances that. And they've been yeah. investing very heavily to to enhance that experience. So I think that's, that's definitely going to come back. I think people are doubting because they're worried about the studios going, historically, cinemas have exclusivity for yes, agreed. 45 to 60 days and those periods moved around. And there is this whole argument that, well, hang on, you know, Disney Plus has been very successful. So Disney Plus is going to put it on Disney Plus. But, you know, they're charging quite high fees to watch films in that 45 day window mm-hmm. at home. Now that might be suitable for a additional film, but as I said, you know, I'm just still going to take my daughters to the cinema. I'm still, still certainly going to go to the cinema. And, you know, this this argument was first played out when VHS video came out. Um, you know, what? Yeah, you're right. Years it was, ago. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, all of these arguments have always been around against cinemas. And in actual fact, you know, the whole play of Cineworld was that they were buying assets in the US to invest in them heavily, um, to put them in a, to, 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 to increase that experience for customers and i think that will come back and of course you know debt is always a risk but debt's not always equal and we invested in several businesses at the bottom of the downturn because we felt you know the debt providers were going to be supportive um and the covenants were particularly light and we feel cine world is in in that place and the de-gearing comes from a recovery in 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 their businesses and the ebitda growing very very quickly yeah. as a result of them being able to operate. You know, it's a very unusual circumstance in that you know, lots of companies in the leisure space, effectively business models have not been allowed to operate. So they'll come back very, very quickly. And I, I do find it strange that the market has been so positive about restaurants and bars and pricing that in, but not about some of the leisure stocks. So mm. I think that's where the next opportunity lies. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I'm going to, as I say, a poll of what moves me and you. We're both heading back to see <laughs> okay, the film. Right. No doubt about it, because we want to... I'll buy the popcorn. Exactly, well, you want the popcorn, you want the ice cream. But also, quite interestingly, is that let's just assume that over the next 12 months, certainly in the next over the next summer, that international travel is not allowed to go full bore simply because of the risk of variants and you don't want to damage your vaccination programmes. Then we're going to lots of people are going to be staycationing, and then and, and if you want any evidence of that, just try and book a campsite in the Lake District yeah. because it's impossible. There's no flipping empty sites at all in Cornwall, Devon, anywhere. So we're staycationing now. If we've got a lot of people who can't staycation or, or are staycation, they want to go to the cinema locally, and now and cinema actually is that is a perfect domestic experience yeah. that you haven't had for twelve months. So. I'm with you. I actually think Cineworld is going to absolutely roar back as people decide to uh, they have had enough of watching flipping streaming stuff on the, on their on their big screens. They will actually want a different experience, and it isn't expensive to go. Now, one one stop which was quite quite interesting is the um, is PPHE Hotels because this is this is an asset play, isn't it, or something? Is that is that more of an asset play, or is it? I mean, I know it's a reopening. It's luxury hotels, isn't it? The, the, yeah, cool. Yeah, no, no, they did. It is an asset play. Um, yeah. I think they've, you know, the management team have been very successful in developing hotels in 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 northern Europe. You know, in Amsterdam, mm. um, uh, part, parts of the Mediterranean, and and London. And what they're very good at, they are they are very much developers, but also very good operators of hotels. Yeah. So it's the point that they take responsibility of all of the whole chain. So a lot of the hotels you go to these days. There'll be somebody who has the operating license. There's somebody who owns the freeholds. Yes. Um, they might even outsource other components of it. It's, it's basically they are bringing lots of components together. Um, the great thing about PPHE is that they they go through getting planning permission. So there's one not far from me. I live in I live in Hackney in um, East London, mm. um, and there's one in Shoreditch. Which you know, if you went back 20 years ago, Shoreditch was pretty rough around the edges. Yeah. Um, you wouldn't have wanted to design a 15-story hotel in the middle of Shoreditch. You'd be like, well, how am I going to sell yeah. all of that space? Now it's a very desirable sort of you know area mm. to go out in for young people. Um, and it took them a long time to work with the council. Um, to get the right planning permission. And they're in the middle of building that hotel, which, um, it, and, and, you know, great timing during this downturn. Um, and they'll be finishing it as they get into 2023. Um, and it will drive a lot of value. Um, and at the moment, they're valuing that on, you know, a very low valuation. Mm. There's a big disconnect between the energy and the value of the assets. Um, and they have enough cash on the balance sheet to to cover them through to recovery. And to your point about, people wanting to staycation. I think there are a lot of people who will want to come to London 
um, from other parts of the UK to, to, to experience what London's got to offer. Um, and I think quite quickly, you know, you'll find London hotels are pretty, pretty fully booked. Yeah, I'm with you. I mean, I think if you can't go abroad, you're going to have a holiday, aren't you? And so you're going to be, you know, you can't go to the seaside, which a lot of people don't want to because it's, it's going to be too busy. Why not go to a nice hotel in the centre of London and do the sites? And I would point investors have a look at the sort of like, I, I saw the, the last published net realisable value of the business, which again is probably pretty conservative, was £22. And I think the shares are on less than £17. So there's a lot of asset backing. And that's sort of like, irrespective of how the actual uh, mm. the reopening goes isn't it so now one which is real s- sweet play to prevent the, uh, to, 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 to apologize for the pun is is hotel chocolat i'm guessing this one sort of benefited by um sort of like affordable treats as people have sort of like you know helped themselves to uh, online deliveries of lovely sort of like um, cocoa powder and all that kind of stuff chocolate yeah, no, I mean, there was a bit of an O flip moment when, you know, uh, lockdown happened first time round um, to businesses like Hotel Chocolate when you go, oh, cool. all of their sites are shut. Um, yeah. But they did have an online business. Now, the amazing thing they've done back to people's desire for sweet treats um, and affordable, affordable luxury, I'd call it. Um, yes. That, you know, they, they, they've grown their online business incredibly, incredibly powerfully. Mm. To the point where, you know, they're, they're actually ahead of where they were in 2019. And this yeah. is still with most of their store estate shut. And the other thing is, this is really, truly a global company. So mm. the Japanese also really love chocolate, um, but they also love gifting. And the Hotel Chocolate is really about, you know, quite often gifting those treats to, to friends and family. Um, and they're taking advantage of that in Japan. So during the crisis, they raised some money to effectively double down um they had really accelerated the number of members they have because people were much more open to looking at things online um and they're really growing that opportunity in in china and and it's also the us as well and and they think they're much more confident about growing the opportunity in the us primarily on an online basis and you know you can scale that business really quite 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 dramatically if you're if you're going to do it online um and, and they've got some solutions to their manufacturing. When I first invested in, in the business, everyone went, oh, you know, it's Thornton's Mark II. It's a fab business. Um, but- well, it was Thornton's. And, you know, Thornton's made the mistake of building this huge, vast factory mm. and then trying to work out how they were going to sell all the products yeah. that came out of it. Um, and, you know, Thornton's, I think, was a great brand in, in the, you know, in the late 80s, early 90s that everyone wanted to buy their products. But then they... They sold them aggressively through the supermarket chains and it became just a commodity. It became, you know, like any other chocolate bar that you could buy on the shelf of a supermarket. And I think Hotel Chocolat is very aware of, you know, this is about building something that's a bit more special. This is not the everyday treat. This is a luxury treat. And that um, and that's a very big market. And I think they've done it in the right way as well. You know, there's been a lot of concern and criticize, criticism about the supply chain of chocolate and where it comes from. Yes. And they've invested very heavily in making sure that they support the farmers that, you know, grow the cocoa uh, and and also, you know, how they look after it through that supply chain, but also the recycling side. Um, and it, have invested very heavily in that. So I think it's, it's very well positioned. It's a global market opportunity. Um, and the business is in rude health. Yeah, hey, I think as, as sort of consumers are more moving up the um, the value that are more towards the sort of like the premiumization chain. I mean, you know, people have had enough of flipping just Cadbury's chocolate eggs. And, and I actually think I have a slightly different take on, on Thornton's simply because I thought the chocolate was rubbish. Uh, and I think there's a different sort of like level of expertise and taste. It's like sort of like uh, Belgian chocolate, you know, which is Hotel de, uh, de Chocolat compared to the stuff we used to get as a, out of our Easter eggs, which was just not, no chocolate at all, which was the old thoughts. That's, I think that, that's where they made the mistake. And I would not be, I mean, again, this is my view, um, investors, but I would not be surprised if somebody like, you know, Kraft or one of the big chocolate guys came knocking to monetize this brand worldwide because, uh, again, it's it's got kudos, it's got actual, you know, desire, and, it, and, it, and just on its own it, and the product, it just deserves a premium. And, it, and that's what food manufacturers need. They need something which they can basically charge a premium. It's a bit like, you know, do you get a standard Tesco whiskey or do you get, you know, a Glenfiddich or something like that? You know, you go for your, your premium, don't you? 
Anyway, now, as I say, we have, we, when we talked about secular growers and we've got some interesting reopening trades. Now, I'd like to we let's work to the super deep value stock. Now, this, this cheap stocks and then this Galliford try. I have never, ever, ever seen a stock this undervalued. If you put the whole cash and the PP, uh, I can't remember what it's called, basically the, the PPP. PPP. Uh, PPP. Public private partnerships. That's it. Yeah, you put that portfolio together, you get about forty million pounds more than you do the market cap. So the value of the business, the market is valuing the business zero or, or or negative. What is happening? Is this is just really just negative sentiment coming out of Carillion, and people haven't really sort of gone back into the sector. I, I was. It's, it's definitely that. So you know, one of the issues with. Um, people in the building and infrastructure space, the contractors, is that historically they've used, um, the cash position has been not their own cash. Yeah, it's so effectively you, you sign up to do a big infrastructure project. The first thing they do once you win that business is write you a massive great check. Yeah. Is what Carillion did. Yeah. And then the problem is you've got a decision about how much do I recognise some of those profits mm -hmm. or in later years, when do I just, uh, you know, develop those yeah, profits? Yeah, contract Trillion accounting. Got, Trillion got on the drug of taking those profits and taking all that customer cash mm. because these projects maybe took five to seven years to deliver and then the back end worrying about it and the reality was carillion didn't have the balance sheet it really had it had a massive hole in the balance sheet yeah so that's the starting position on galliford try but why is this different the one thing that galliford try has always prided itself is doing small local projects mm. that are short time to delivery so this is building a small secondary school um, building, you know, a small extension to a prison, roadworks, but generally in areas of structural growth, so utilities, education, um, highways. Yeah. But they're all small projects that are a good size relative to the size of the business. And they want to get to be doing sort of 1.3 to 1.5 billion of revenues per year. But more importantly, the way they account for everything is they don't take a load of cash up front. Most of their projects are relatively cash neutral. Mm -hmm. So they get paid when they need to pay for materials, for yeah. labor and everything else. Um, and you work through that and then you, you can realize a profit at the end. And they believe they can get to sort of two and a half percent margins, which is actually at the conservative end. It's relatively reasonable. Um, and you do that. The business can be throwing off, you know, a good sort of 25 million of cash. Yeah. Um, and as you say, 25 million of cash for uh, a 40 to 50 million um, pound um, negative EV. Yeah, so I know. It's a there's a lot of value there, but I, I do think you have to worry about the sector as a whole because people have been very worried about it because mm -hmm. the likes of some of the bigger players have taken massive provisions. But the whole yeah. industry has changed. The way that government procures builders has changed because they realize that they don't want other Carillions to happen. So they've looked at ways of supporting the industry, sub, supporting the subcontractors. So ultimately, well, I think we're at the bottom of a long-term sort of negative cycle, if you like, and we're now in the upswing. The government's going to spend more money on infrastructure. Mm -hmm. They want it more effectively delivered. Um, and Galliford's got a very conservative management team. And as you said, the, the, the shares are absurdly cheap. Yeah, I mean, uh, and they fixed. The, they seem to have fixed the balance sheet because they sold their house building business, didn't they? I think it was about eighteen months ago or so. And so they've got about you know over a hundred million of sort of like you know average end monthly cash. So uh, they should be absolutely fine. Um, and what was also interesting, I was having a look at the short interest, and about a year ago they were sort of like four percent short interest. There's nobody who short the stock mm. anymore. Which says always, always is a good sign when the smart money says, no, this isn't going down, it's going up. <laughs> Another one which has been going up, which has been going through the, um, you know, through um, certainly over, it's been one of the actual saviors of the NHS actually over the last 12 months has been totally, I think that's run by a lady called uh, Wendy Lawrence. And yeah. um, they've been, they run the sort of the, the 111 service, but I think, if you, do you want to take us through that one? Because I think you're in good company. I think I think Gervais Williams also owns a big slug of this company. Yeah, and I think Wendy's done a, an amazing job, especially during COVID, because actually COVID's been a really tough time for this business. Yeah, yeah. Um, because the NHS has just been focused on making sure that, you know, the hospitals didn't get overwhelmed rather than delivering better services. But as we come out of this, there's a huge opportunity for Totally because, you know, as we all know, there's lots of people on the waiting list. Well, you know, the highest... 4.7 million, I believe, at yeah. the last count, and growing rapidly. 
And and the thing, you know, one of the issues is that what Totally is not trying to do is compete with the NHS, which mm. often, you know, there are private providers. There are only so yeah. many doctors and nurses in the UK. What what Totally is trying to do is make the NHS more productive. Um, so, you know, uh, 911 services is about making sure and understanding who really needs to go to A&E, who can wait till tomorrow to go and see their local GP. Um, and, and that makes the NHS a lot more efficient and, and running it efficiently in the right way is, is a difficult thing to do. But, you know, Wendy and the, her team have got a huge amount of experience in doing it. And it's the only provider that's actually got the scale and national coverage, even though it's a small business. Back to your point around, you know, if you're going to invest in a small business, invest in a small business, it's got a very strong position in its niche. Mm-hmm. Um, and the other areas of great growth are, are within critical care. So, you know, if you go into A&E, you know, who do you need to be seen by? And, and what you don't want is, you know, your leg half falling off or you've you've had a stroke and you're sitting behind somebody who, you know, is maybe being overly cautious and has put a nail through their finger. Now, putting a nail through your finger might not be very nice, but you probably actually can go and see a senior nurse yeah. who can stitch it up and 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 send you on your way and, and book you in to have a, you know, a, a, a follow up with a consultant, not in real time. Whereas if you've had that stroke, you need to be at the front of the queue. And that's a very difficult service to deliver. Yeah. but incredibly important for the NHS in terms of um, getting primary care into a better place. And, and that's what Totally has also been very, very effective at starting to deliver. And they've only done that in small parts of the country. So there's a big opportunity for them to roll out those services across the NHS in, in the coming years. So I think, yeah, there's a lot of opportunity for the business. Um, and I think the NHS is, 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 very, um, is a very happy customer. Yeah, I mean, productivity improvements in the NHS, given that these guys have just been, you know, flogged to death over the last 12 months, they're tired, a lot of them have got long COVID, and therefore they need help, specialist help from, from Totally. And I, I think that that outpays effectively the, the waiting list of 4.7 million, which is growing rapidly because a lot of people haven't been screened for sort of cancer and other sort of like problems and stuff, been able to effect well I think they've got an insourcing division or something so yes. essentially that means that, that allows when the NHS's own hospitals are not treating patients at the weekend then they bring totally brings its staff in to be able to get uh, to use that NHS equipment with the totally staff to reduce the, the patient waiting list for the NHS so you're right I mean productivity and getting more from your assets makes perfect sense now another one which is like a, a great management team seems to have really turned, you know, turned the, the corner or, you know, driving value is, is having Traz. And again, I didn't even know what it means, but, you know, sort of like I was looking <laughs> at it and it's sort of like a, a, a bit of a sort of a, they almost like a, a private equity buy and build and then sell. And they, they, they sold a, a business called Peter Brotherhood, I think, about two or three months ago at four times the money they paid for it. And they've got a big lot of cash and, it looks as though it's still pretty much undervalued to me, but I don't want you, you your take. It's a guy called is it Steve McQuillan or something? Yeah, no, he's, he's, yeah, Steve's done an amazing job. I mean, it, it is effectively you know buying into small businesses that are that have have great opportunities, but are just have been mismanaged mm. quite often because they're they're parts of larger businesses. Yeah, um, but also just because maybe they've had the wrong ownership structure and people haven't known how to move them forward. It's niche engineering uh, parts, isn't it? It's basically specialist. Effectively, they've got a dominant position like blast doors and critical yeah. pumps. Yeah, so and you know they bought, they, like bought that, some, they bought some assets out of administration from. Um, Booth. yeah it's booth yeah right. and and yeah they they make blast doors so this is for the underground in the uk but will also be for um uh for hs2, HS2. yeah um and you know they're very specialist and they basically own all of the blueprint and the designs for all of these doors and they've got a very very long order book and mm. you know if you can manage it in the right way and just you know your customers want a decent job done the problem for a lot of these companies is that they they were so desperate to win the business they sort of you know underbid um and you know steve knows the value that they add and so they they get the right price for the the quality of product or service that they're delivering they're not afraid to ask for it and they also get the operating structure of the business in the right shape they don't waste money and they've got some you know they're not just the end of sort of heavier engineering as you say like mm. blast doors they've also got some interesting areas in medical manufacturing so they actually have the basically the the ip to to build a uh, a mini mri yeah and most mri are these vast great things that need a huge great specialist room 
But, you know, back to the point of waiting lists, you know, you need small MRIs for being able to scan people's knees, arms, mm. wrists, but also veterinary world. So the veterinary world, people are spending a lot more money on their pets and animals and want them looked after. You can't have an MRI scanner in a veterinary practice. It's just too expensive. Yeah. And basically, there's no one really with a product on the market. And they're, they're going to launch a product in the next couple of years. But this is all icing on the cake. This is not yeah. This is not in the valuation of the business at the moment. Um, it's just really in the engineering businesses they hold. But as you said, you know, this is not an expensive set of assets with a with a with a very, very strong management team. Yeah, I mean, again, it's an indication of sort of like you're in good company here, uh, James, because a lot like with um, with Gervais Williams in totally, I understand Chris Mills has bought a big uh, a big yes. stake about a year ago. Uh, I, the one thing I know about Christopher Mills is that he's he's pretty shrewd when it comes to uh, to valuation. So uh, I think this one's got a long way to go. Now, one which is um, uh, listed again just recently, uh, Manolay, which is I think is a um, an insolvency litigation financing firm, which in, in broad terms, I believe, is funding working capital to the insolvency practitioners to be able to sort of like sort out theirs. Right. Yeah. But, was, but it, again, this one's massively, it's really, really, really cheap still. It's sort of like, you know, about eight or nine times PE. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting because it had a fairly unique model in that, mm. I mean, which is space, which, you know, you wouldn't necessarily suddenly, unless you'd been an insolvency practitioner, um, go, you understand, but um, you know it's it's a it's a strange part of the market. You know, this is effectively a business goes into administration, and some of the creditors who are owed money um, look to make a claim. That can be a pension pot, it can yeah. be HMRC, um, and an insolvency practitioner is appointed. But that insolvency practitioner doesn't have necessarily any assets. It has no claim to the assets, and as you say, it needs to it needs to fund its claim because it only gets paid right at the end, doesn't it, by the court. Well, exactly. So now you can either go to third party providers of capital who aren't really involved in the process, don't necessarily understand the process, mm. or Manalay, who effectively guarantees the outcome, but does understand the process and is working there to make sure that it gets all the way carried all the way through to, yeah. to succession. I think the thing is that Manalay have said, well, you know, we are so confident in our ability to access the, out access the outcome that they put skin in the game. And that's the big difference. Right. And so they'll take people to court. So quite often they get early settlement because people know, look, at the end of the day, we know you've got the assets. We know you've got the money elsewhere and we're going to take you to court. And by that time, the amount of legal fees that you'll have racked up mm. means that you might as well pay now. And, you know, this is important to having, you know, a good, effective, you know, mechanism for making sure that businesses, you know, carry on, be healthy. And, and you know, you've got to remember all those creditors are in a very difficult place if they don't get paid out. So, it is it's it's an important function, but there's a huge it's a huge market, um, and they're a specialist, and I think they have an opportunity for growth. The problem during COVID has been that effectively going into administration for a period was restricted by the government, um, and so there wasn't the normal rate of businesses just yeah. not working out and having to move forward, and that marketplace effectively declined. Yeah. But come the autumn, we think that marketplace will will come back, and so Manalay will will recover. Yeah, well, I say for investors have a look at it because it's about nine times PE, so it's got to be reasonably good value. Now, just the last one, which is uh, again another really interesting one, which is a real high quality, uh, I would say, you know, uh, business Marlow, which I put into the camp of a super durable growth company because wow. it's actually <laughs> done really well, hasn't it, in terms of regulate over the last twelve months, and it's still growing, and the margins are great. Do you take us through this one? Buy and build, I think, isn't it? Yeah, it's buy and build, and I think it's buy and build, you know, because buy and build can be quite risky, yeah. um, but it's buy and build in the right way because all the markets it operates in are regulated. So this is everything from... It's property, you know, someone, isn't it? Yeah, so someone needing to come around to your office or your retail premises or your, 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 your restaurants and not only check, this is where they started, check your fire systems work and your water's, you know, being, mm. you know, checked to make sure it's clean and Think all of those sorts of things. Think Grenfell here. Yeah. Huh? Think Grenfell. Yeah, exactly. All, all of those sorts of aspects. But also it's moved into some other areas such as um, safety and compliance mm. um, in terms of staff, you know, whether you're looking after their mental health, whether you're looking after their prospects. And that's I think that's going to come back even stronger than it has done prior to COVID. So I think you're going to have a greater focus on companies in terms of looking after the staff. But I think the key thing, this was a very fragmented market. So, you know, this was mainly run by, you know, sole traders, small individuals running relatively small businesses. 
And what Marlow's done is they've vested very heavily in core technology to basically increase the efficiency of collecting all this data when you go into a customer's. Yeah. And it's a bit like any sort of milk ground business. So, you know, when you were talking about milk ground business, how many customers can you see in a day? Mm. So national density is really important. You know, if you've got one client, yes. you go into their property premises to look at their fire and safety regulation. Yeah, okay. The next customer's 100 miles away. You're going to spend most of your day going to the next customer. Mm. If your next customer is 200 yards down the road, suddenly you've built huge efficiency into your business mm. model. So you've got this flywheel effect in Marlow, one of having put all this central cost of a very efficient IT system in place, but also the milk round effect of um, your buy and build strategy. But again, moving um, up the curve from doing fire safety to also doing sort of desktop based, if you like, sort of um, mental awareness, mental health awareness, and a whole plethora of things that sit around you know, HR and businesses, which carries essentially much higher margin and much better operational gearing. So I think there's a long way to go in terms of their ability to buy businesses. And they raised a big cash pile not that long that. ago. Um, and I think the earnings potential from that cash pile are not yet reflected in the um, in the outlook for the business. Yeah, I, I think they've, they've put a number out there. I think the revenue they're hoping to do for this year or for the next 12 months is 250 but in three years they're hoping to do double that 500 yeah. uh, 500 million and there's now three things you've taught me this morning were at least three things one to uh, to book with uh, uh, jet two two to uh, go and work as a sales guy for blue prism and, and finally three the net uh, the uh, the milk ground uh, effect for investing i've never heard that one before so uh thank you very much now just before we finish is there anything you've been sort of lightening up selling at all or or, or, or avoiding or have you just really been kept in your position um sort of close to your chest at the moment no i think i think um at this moment in the cycle you know everyone gets uh, quite excited about all those cyclical plays mm -hmm. you know with the economy recovering which is a big opportunity but at yeah. the same time quite often some people forget about some of those structural plays because on a short-term basis they maybe go well i, I can see the cyclical gravity is a big opportunity so i won't pull out names but i would say some of those longer term structural plays where we think those markets are going to continue to grow. We've been topping up while the market's, market's been a little bit more focused around the cyclical plays that they say play, see playing out across the summer, the opening up plays uh, in the summer and the autumn. Well, I'm going to I'm going to take one hazard a guess, and please don't respond. But I think you've been topping at Blue Prism there in that case. <laughs> I would say because that's the most undervalued. If that hit, if that hits the you know what it can do, then uh, it's it's massively undervalued in five years' time. But uh, there's obviously a few ifs in that one. But anyway, thanks very much for your time, James. Uh, if investors want to contact you and sort of like invest in the funds, where's the best place to do that? Is it through this IFA contact you direct web company website or or where? Um, I think all the channels. It's on all the platforms. Yeah, you can okay. come to the Thread Needle has its own uh, its own portal. But yeah, most of the platforms or your own IFA would be uh, would be the best place to go. Brilliant. Well, thanks very much for your time, uh, James, and uh, look forward to touching base probably hopefully in about some six months' time. Great. Thanks, Paul. Brilliant. Thanks for your time.